Pints with Jack, Season 4, Episode 101. Bonus episode. Jack versus Tollers. Welcome everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast where Andrew, Matt and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. And today's episode is a last minute replacement. You see, Andrew had some interviews lined up and they all fell through at the last moment. So I thought I would just jump on and record a solo episode uh, because I've got a few things that I wanted to talk about while I've got access to a microphone. But we're still going to try and keep it as much like a normal episode as possible. And so we are going to have a quote of the week. And since today's episode is going to be a bit of fun and rather tongue-in-cheek, I thought I'd go with something which Lewis said, which we find recorded in Walt Hooper's book, C.S. Lewis, Companion and Guide. Lewis apparently said, There's no sound I like better than adult male laughter. And for my drink of the week, I am currently drinking a Mystic Monk coffee. It was sent to me by my friend Rainer in Nebraska, uh, and uh, hopefully you'll understand why very shortly. Anyway. Cheers. Okay, so first up, uh, this episode is actually being recorded after the season finale episodes, which will be airing next week. And so at the risk of confusing you and at the risk of disrupting the space-time continuum, uh, I want to tell you what's happened since recording those episodes. And the most important thing is that Marie has safely delivered our son. Alexander Charbel Bates was born on September 9th. He weighed exactly seven pounds and measured at 20 and a half inches. Now, I know a lot of people were expecting us to call him something like Jack or Lewis or Gilbert, uh, but we went with Alexander Charbel. Uh, Alexander means defender of the people and Charbel means God the King. And Charbel is a more unusual name, And we chose it because Marie is of Lebanese descent, and Saint Charbel is a very prominent saint among the Maronites. And he has this really inspiring life story. And actually, if you Google his name in YouTube, do you Google in YouTube? If you search for his name in YouTube, you'll find uh, a full movie about the life of Saint Charbel. And it's all quite wonderful. And this brings me on to the second thing that I wanted to say. If you would like to meet my son, Alexander is going to be at the Sidecar Day celebrations. Sidecar Day is on September 28th, and it's when we commemorate Lewis's conversion to Christianity. If you recall, after the long late night talk with Dyson and Tolkien, the final obstacles to Lewis's conversion were cleared away. And in the closing paragraphs of Surprised by Joy, Lewis writes uh, what happened soon afterwards. He says, I know very well when, but hardly how, the final step was taken. I was driven to Whipsnade one sunny morning. When we set out, I did not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when we reached the zoo, I did. Yet, I had not exactly spent the journey in thought, nor in great emotion. It was more like when a man, after long sleep, still lying motionless in bed, becomes aware that he is now awake. And so because of this, on September 28th, all Patreon supporters are going to be invited to gather on a group video chat. We will mix a cocktail, also conveniently called a sidecar, and we'll introduce you to our son, and we'll hang out and chat for about an hour. We're going to be doing this at 5pm Pacific, which is the same thing as 7pm Central and 8pm on the East Coast. And details and the video link will be available both in Slack and on our Patreon website. Next up, I just wanted to mention something in reference to Tuesday's episode with David Radford from the Grey Havens. You may recall that their album is called Blue Flower, and it's a reference to a line in Surprised by Joy, where Lewis says that the green hills which he could see from his nursery windows as a small child, they taught him longing. And he says, they made me for good or ill, and before I was six years old, a votary of the blue flower. And it was mentioned in that episode that the phrase blue flower is incredibly rare in Lewis's corpus, uh, despite it being so tied to his central idea of joy and longing. However, since recording that episode, we actually found one more reference. And to that, we have to thank Dr. Michael Ward. 
I sent Father Ward a message letting him know about the interview and that the Blue Flower album had sprung from the suggestion by one of David's friends to read Father Ward's book, Planet Narnia. And Father Ward responded in his usual gracious style. He says, I'm delighted to know this. Thank you. I wonder whether David and his wife have noticed this passage from The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, in which Lucy and Susan take a ride on the back of the resurrected Aslan. And I just want to read this, because I don't know how I missed this for so long. That ride was perhaps the most wonderful thing that happened to them in Narnia. Have you ever had a gallop on a horse? Think of that, and then take away the heavy noise of the hoofs and the jingle of bits, and imagine the almost noiseless padding of the great paws. Then imagine, instead of the black or grey or chestnut back of the horse, the soft roughness of golden fur, and the mane flying back in the wind. And then imagine you are going about twice as fast as the fastest racehorse. But this is a mount that doesn't need to be guided and never grows tired. He rushes on and on, never missing his footing, never hesitating, threading his way with perfect skill between tree trunks, jumping over bush and briar and the smaller streams, wading the larger, swimming the largest of all. And you are riding not on a road, nor in a park, nor even on the downs, but right across Narnia, in spring, down solemn avenues of beech and across sunny glades of oak, through wild orchards of snow-white cherry trees, past roaring waterfalls and mossy rocks and echoing caverns, up windy slopes alight with gorse bushes, and across the heavy shoulders of heathery mountains, and along giddy ridges, and down, down, down again, into wild valleys, and out into acres of blue flowers. I don't know how on earth I ever miss that. <laughs> but it is a wonderful image. The children are riding on the resurrected Aslan. All their hopes and dreams are coming true and they are rushing through entire valleys of acres of blue flowers. And finally, we come to the last thing that I wanted to talk about today. And this is why today's episode is called Jack versus Tollers. Because a couple of months ago, our audio engineer, Taylor Schroll, invited me onto his show, Forte Catholic, and he wanted me to debate Caitlin, who actually appeared on Pints with Jack before, and she runs the Tea with Tolkien podcast and website. Taylor wanted us to debate who we thought was better, C.S. Lewis or J.R.R. Tolkien. And I thought it was a good debate. We are at least all still speaking to each other. And I had sketched out some arguments in preparation for this debate. And because of time constraints, and also having the desire to still have some friends talk to me at the end of the episode, uh, I didn't get to use all of my material. So given that Andrew's interviews fell through, I thought I would take the opportunity to present my full argument as to why I think C.S. Lewis is better than J.R.R. Tolkien. <clears throat> My lords, ladies, gentlemen, fauns, naiads, centaurs, hobbits. C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien were both great men, but it is a fact that C.S. Lewis is better. Over the course of this address, I hope to conclusively demonstrate as to why. First of all, C.S. Lewis was the better scholar and professor. He gained a triple first from Oxford in classics, philosophy, and English, gaining his first in English in a single year rather than the usual three. He also produced more scholarly work and was a far more engaging lecturer than Tolkien, whose lectures were notoriously poorly attended. It's true that both men were writers, but I would argue that C.S. Lewis is the superior writer. Firstly, when it comes to volume. While Tolkien spent most of his life struggling through his magnum opus, The Lord of the Rings, as an adult, Lewis cranked out a new book practically every year. In fact, Lewis and Tolkien had flipped a coin to decide which of them would write a space travel story and which of them would write a time travel story. Lewis was assigned the space travel story and rapidly produced his Ransom trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet, Perilandra, and That Hideous Strength. By contrast, the Lost Road, which was the title of Tolkien's story, its development languished, and it was ultimately abandoned. And all this was while Tolkien did his work from the relative ease of a professorship, 
whereas Lewis did much of his work while slaving away still as a lowly tutor. Uh, George Sayer noted that Tolkien was probably a little bit jealous of Lewis with regard to his productivity, and Lewis himself said that Tolkien had the work rate of a coral insect. So Lewis is the superior writer when it comes to volume, but he's also the superior writer when it comes to variety. I've said before, he was a jack of all genres. His work spans almost every genre imaginable. He wrote essays, apologetics, sermons, fairy tales, science fiction, poetry, anthology. He also wrote an autobiography, and not to mention his professional work in literary criticism. Now, some Tolkien fans might admit that yes, Lewis did write more books, and yes, in more genres, but they then may have the temerity to assert that Tolkien is still the better writer. And this is incorrect. They might argue that Tolkien put more thought into his work. Well, anyone who's read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings will know that Tolkien was definitely making things up as he went along. And while Tolkien builds his world in painstaking detail, tracking the what the moon is doing and which flowers are in season, Lewis, I would argue, is much more evocative. He allows the reader's imagination to come alive and fill in the details from the mental sketches that he gives. I am also tempted to note that Tolkien's books are a bit of a brofest. Decent female characters are a little thin on the ground. The female dwarves may be indistinguishable from the men because of their beards, but I think it would still have been nice to meet one in his books. And I think the Ents were poorer for not having their Ent wives. On the other hand, Lewis has great heroines, such as Lucy, Aravis, and Polly in the Chronicles of Narnia, and Orwell in Till We Have Faces. But despite saying all of this, I will concede that The Lord of the Rings is a masterpiece. But it's a masterpiece for which we have Lewis to thank. Tolkien himself said that Lewis was for the long time my only audience. Only from him did I ever get the idea that my stuff could be more than a private hobby. But for his interest and unceasing eagerness for more, I should never have brought The Lord of the Rings to a conclusion. And so from just this quotation alone, I would suggest that any argument about literary excellence is ultimately an argument in favour of Lewis who both encouraged, critiqued, and helped get Tolkien's works published. Now, in the debate, Caitlin wanted to do something similar, to claim that all of Lewis's achievements are ultimately attributable to Tolkien, because Tolkien was instrumental in Lewis's conversion to Christianity. However, on that late-night walk along Addison's Walk, Tolkien wasn't the only one there. Hugo Dyson was also integral in helping bring Lewis to Christianity. So Lewis may well have converted, even without the presence of Tolkien. And I say the same thing is true for their literary work as well. C.S. Lewis was already on the map before the Inklings, with the Allegory of Love. And also much of his best work appeared after the Inklings. Surprised by Joy, Reflections on the Psalms, Till We Have Faces, The Four Loves, and Letters to Malcolm. Lewis was supremely generous. His books earned him considerable wealth, but he gave away two-thirds of his income anonymously through the Agape Fund, which was established by his solicitor friend, Owen Barfield. Lewis found joy in a wide range of books. His Catholicity is one of the reasons for the success of The Inklings. And despite Dr. Holly Ordway showing us that Tolkien read much more widely than we might have previously imagined, nevertheless, in contrast, Tolkien describes himself as a man of narrow tastes. And these narrow tastes often didn't include his friend's books, despite the fact that Lewis put Tolkien in the starring role of his science fiction trilogy and dedicated the Screwtape Letters to him, a book which got Lewis on the cover of Time magazine. Both Lewis and Tolkien were offered a CBE, but Lewis turned down this honour. Both men fought in World War I, but Lewis also addressed the nation during World War II. Now, I wouldn't want anyone listening to imagine that I dislike Tolkien. Not at all. As Lewis himself wrote in his diary after meeting him, there's no harm in him, only needs a smack or so. And this actually brings me to another reason why I think Lewis is better than Tolkien. His sense of humour. You find it throughout all of his works, across all genres. And when you read about his life, you discover that this began at a young age. One of my favourite anecdotes about Lewis is that when he was a little boy of about five, he told his father that he had a prejudice against the French. And when his father asked him why he had a prejudice, the young Lewis replied, if I knew why, it would not be a prejudice. 
We must also speak about Lewis's role as a Christian apologist and evangelist. It is entirely proper that many regard him as the premier Christian apologist of the 20th century. His impact on church and culture is incalculable. How many people could cite Lewis as an important part of their conversion or reversion? My co-host Andrew helped produce a book called Mere Christians, which includes accounts from 55 prominent Christians whose spiritual lives have been dramatically altered by reading Lewis's books. And so to wrap up, John Ronald Rule Tolkien. That's easily mispronounced, and what kind of name is Rule anyway? Lewis Rules. Also, two initials in a name should be more than enough for anybody. Three is clearly excessive. And for all that's said about Tolkien's languages, none of them are on Duolingo, unlike Klingon and High Valerian from Game of Thrones. Lewis was better looking. Lewis has the best fans. Lewis was the inspiration for the greatest podcast in internet history, Pints with Jack. And I feel that this, together with all of my preceding points and arguments, more than adequately demonstrates that when it comes to comparing J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, the C.S. in C.S. Lewis could very easily also stand for clearly superior. (laughs) So obviously this speech was a little tongue-in-cheek. And I obviously love Tolkien and I love Lewis. And actually, one of the most delightful things about the debate on Forte Catholic was that Taylor encouraged us at the end to say something nice about the opposing side and asked, can we really be friends? And on the show, I said that I thought I had been a little bit naughty in my assessment of Tolkien. And I don't think Lewis would really approve, although I also have a suspicion that he might get a good laugh out of it. And I shared that section of The Four Loves that Andrew is often fond of quoting, that the human mind is generally far more eager to praise and dispraise than describe and define, that it makes every distinction a distinction of value, hence those fatal critics who can never point out the differing qualities of two poets without putting them in order of preference, as if they were candidates for a prize. Both Tolkien and Lewis had their strengths, and we don't actually have to say whether or not one is better or not. And even if I don't include Tolkien's penchant for wearing snappy-looking waistcoats, I love many of his works, and even some of his shorter works like Leaf by Niggle, and those delightful Father Christmas letters. And I ended my time on Taylor's show by saying that the world is a better place for having both C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. And I pointed to Bandersnatch, the book by Dr. Diana Glyer, where she clearly demonstrates how these two men supported one another, Uh, how they helped each other to become two of the most powerful literary voices of the 20th century and to be the dyad and inspiration at the heart of the Inklings. And that was all I really wanted to say today. As always, thanks to everyone for supporting us, all our Patreon supporters, particularly our top tier supporters, Dawn, Sterling, Shane, John, Kevin, Brian, Kay, Monique, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Matt, Jeff, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate and Rowdy. As always, we can be found at our website, pintswithjack.com, as well as on social media. I'm going to be working hard on the website over the coming weeks uh, between our seasons. Next week, we're going to be wrapping up Season 4 with Parts 1 and 2 of our season finale. And please join us then when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers! Cheers!